So we'll begin with chapter 10 today. Bodhavum Shandiyum Knowledge and Peace This is Atmanirvati chapter 10. So if you've got chapters 1 through 9, the last thing that Atmananda said in the previous chapter is that if you have experientially recognized what is meant by the world originates from consciousness and then dissolves back into consciousness. If you recognize this experientially, then an attitude change occurs. Now we must examine ourselves to see has an attitude change really occurred in me? Then only does this attitude change reflect into the Deha Buddhi, the body mind, which is translated as the behavior change. Now, if you have started seeing this experientially, that my real nature is objectless consciousness, you will start understanding the meaning of the word Chitta Chaya. Now, in your own experience, you see that every morning I recognize that the consciousness reflects out, outwards. And the body and the mind are just a reflection of the consciousness. When this becomes clear, a complete change occurs in the way one looks at everything. Everything means this world and this body-mind complex. It becomes clear that I, the objectless consciousness, I shine. And my outgoing rays are the body and mind. I'm like the sun and the outgoing rays are this body and mind and the world. These rays withdraw after a while. And that is termed as the end of the waking state. The end of the day. The end of the physical body state. The rays withdraw further and then that is the end of the dream state, end of the mind state. And then I return to my original seed state, which is the objectless state. Again next morning, I again go out. Again in the night, I come back in. So this experientially, if you have started seeing regularly, then you will very clearly understand what Atmananda is saying in this chapter. If this has become your experiential recognition, then the physical body and the mind being a reflection of me, the consciousness, this is evident moment to moment to moment. Whether there is drama going on in the family, at work, with friends or everything is just quiet and silent. It doesn't matter. Moment to moment to moment, it is clear that there is just a reflection. It's like a movie is going on. And there is a clear seeing that there is nothing inside, no I inside. There is nobody home. So, everybody has their hand mirror. Yeah. Let's bring the hand mirror in front of us. You have your hand mirror. You don't need to look at me. Now just look at your reflection in the mirror. Look at your skin carefully. Look at the wrinkles, the pimples, the shape of the eyes, the nose, the lips. 
ears. Look at the hairline. When you're completely consumed by your looks in the mirror, you feel that reflection is I. But do you recognize that reflection is not I? And keep looking at the mirror. Keep looking at the mirror. Recognize that that reflection is not I. Instead of that attention which is going towards the reflection, point the arrow of attention exactly 180 degrees. Yeah? Instead of being Bahir Mukhi, turn the attention Antar Mukhi. Keeping your eyes on your reflection, the attention should be inwards. Yeah? Keep it Antar Mukhi. This inside is real I. Outside is simply a reflection. If this is clear, now simply put the mirror down. The body mind are Exactly similarly, the reflection of I, the consciousness. I, the consciousness, open out the petals of this mind and then the body. It's like a flower blossoming. And I, the consciousness, close the petals of the body and mind. Like a flower folds back into a bud. The petals are not different from the flower. There is no in and no out really. There is no to. This is the real meaning of Advaita. If this understanding has become very clear, it means your foundation is strong. So let's see the meaning of no to. Now you are watching me on this computer screen. The true meaning of Advaita is there is just one arising at a time. It is not I the seer of the arising and the scene that is arising together and falling together. There are no two. There is just one yeah, or no two. So now pay careful attention. When you are perceiving Ekta on that computer screen, there is only the perception of either Ekta's sight or there is the perception of Ekta's sound. Yeah? So now focus carefully. Now, when you start focusing, you start seeing Ekta more clearly. And when you focus on the face, the, the eyes, the grey hair, you notice the face, the colour of the skin, you suddenly miss what Ekta is saying. And when there is perception of sound, you are making an effort to not miss a single word then the face is kind of defocused. The perception of sight is not there. Do you notice this? There is only one perception at a moment. There is just one arising at a time. Yeah? When you are intensely listening, you are not intently looking. When you are intently looking, you are not intensely listening. If I say something new, there is an understanding happening in the pause between the two sentences. 
and if the understanding takes a little longer than the pause i give you miss the window of perception of the next sentence you see this yeah when there is a thought i need to pay attention now there is only the perception of thought you have missed what ekta said at that moment and when there is a bad feeling arising along after this thought that i didn't get it a bad feeling arises that who oh, i didn't get it then there is perception only of that feeling are you recognizing this yeah there is no two at a time there is only one perception or only one sensation or only a feeling or only a thought or only nothingness the material that all these are made up of is also nothingness so there is no two really there is just advait yeah the witness and the witnessed are not two the knower and the known are not two the subject and the object are not two there is no i there really that is experiencing the objects otherwise it would imply two we learn this at advaita level 1 where we imply subject and object but really look it's not true there are no two in fact there is nothing like experiencing there is nothing like experience if you examine closely you will see that you cannot really describe it it is simply a puzzle very indescribable but consciousness and experience are not two they are one and the same there is no two there we have only labeled this as an experience this is a conditioning yeah this needs to be unlearned this is bahirmukhi this is antarmukhi only labels yeah there is no individual i that exists there to experience being bahirmukhi or antarmukhi it's like an empty space there's just empty space of awareness that same awareness in motion becomes a thought or a feeling or a sensation or a perception and in between two arisings it goes back to its original nature of the space the space like nature there is no external object that is experienced and there is no internal experience of it is simply the same knowingness playing different roles wearing different hats it is only one consciousness yeah experience is simply a word simply a concept an idea yeah it is the pure i or consciousness which is shining through in in between and coming up as a thought a feeling a perception sensation but these are really if you look carefully it's really nothing but no thingness emptiness consciousness their material is not different yeah so atmananda in this chapter is going to take your attention towards two of these objects feelings and thoughts so first let's take the example of feeling now during the interval between two feelings there is no state you cannot say that there was that particular feeling there yeah in the gap between two feelings there is no feeling So what is there in the gap between two feelings 
any any feeling you are feeling sad the sadness arises it goes away again it arises again it goes away there is a gap in between the two arising and falling waves in this gap you are the pure consciousness the same nothingness it is devoid of any sadness any feeling so here one is peace itself because the state of consciousness is devoid of feeling and devoid of feeling equals to peace so what is peace peace is the absence of objects it's a quiet equanimity in the interval between two feelings there is nothing so if this is clear you will now understand the first verse udayam laya meerandum shandiyal tanne yagayal shandiyanu vikaratin swaroopa madhu nischayam since feelings arise and set in peace their swaroopa is peace and last two words were not translated i think madhu nischayam so their swaroopa is sweet peace definitely yeah and what is the meaning of swaroopa their real nature their real form the actual form that which feelings are made up of is peace and it is a sweet peace madhu so just like a wave arises and sets in the ocean what is the wave made up of the same water as the ocean yeah what is the background of the wave the ocean so what is in between two waves the ocean right exactly like that the background of any arising and falling feeling is peace the real form of that feeling form means what it is made up of the actual material of that is peace peace in motion becomes a feeling a feeling at rest is peace and you say what about hatred i get so so much hatred for this person or that person look at it very carefully peace in motion is hatred the same hatred again dissolves disappears where does it disappear into hatred at rest is peace its swarupa is peace peace in motion is lust or passion and that same passion at rest is peace every moment of passion keeps disappearing you want it more you make that passion increase again it disappears again you want it more it comes up again it disappears what is it disappearing into peace yeah. whether the feeling is pleasant or unpleasant everything dissolves and disappears back into its original material form or the material that it is made up of the real form that is peace yeah we all hugged our kids our beloved you want to get closer you want to hug you want more warmth the embrace dissolves disappears you again want to hug tighter why 
because that embrace, that warmth, that pleasantness went back into its original form or original Swarupa, peace. So peace is really nothing but the absence of that warmth of the embrace. Again, you want the warmth of the embrace, it comes up, it plays, it disappears. Now it is absent. It has dissolved into peace. Again, you hug tighter. It comes, it plays. Again, it falls away. It goes back into peace. The same thing happens when you eat something delicious. You have such a pleasant feeling. It disappears dissolves back into the background of peace. It is made up of peace. Yeah, so it's very easy to understand things like a delicious food or a warm embrace. Now focus on your weak points. Some people are haunted by fears. Some people are haunted by some kind of sadness. Some people are haunted by arrogance or ego. Whatever it is, whatever strong emotion comes up in you and holds on to you again and again. Notice it. Whatever it is, that fear, that unpleasantness that has come up, it does not remain forever. It arises and it disappears. What does it disappear into? Oh, it disappears into an absence of fear. So there is fear and then there is absence of fear. Then again there is fear and then there is absence of fear. Oh, this absence of fear is the real Swarupa of fear. This peace, this background is the real Swarupa of fear. This peace is the real Swarupa of hatred. This peace is the absence of that negative feeling. So dive deeper into that emotion. Instead of running away from it, you dive deeper into it. When you dive deeper into it, you understand that it is not as overwhelming as I made it to be. The mind story exaggerates things out of proportion. But when I actually face that fear, that sadness, that hatred, that jealousy, whatever the emotion is, when you dive deep into it, you recognize it disappears back into its background. So work on your pain points because only those are the obstacles remaining on your path going forward. Only those few major emotional things that consume you. Yeah, and they won't be like many. You will be able to count them on one hand. Now there will be just those two, three things really that are an obstacle. Now you use your viveka to see what that feeling is, how long it lasts, how strong is this? Is this really something that is constant or does it disappear? Yeah, and then you just stay. And you go deeper and sink deeper into whatever the heaviness, the sadness, the hatred, fear. Go deeper, deeper, deeper and there you hit peace. When you sleep at night, there is no sadness. There is no fear. There is no hatred in the deep sleep state. And forget about the deep sleep state. Even when you wake up in the morning, 
first there is that sense of I am or just that I thought or that just pure witnessing. Just that sense is there. In that also there is no sadness, there is no hatred, no jealousy. Only when that I goes and attaches with a thought that says I am sad, then the whole mind story comes back. The feeling of sadness comes up. See right here in your own experience, it is only an objectification of thought. The I attached itself to the am sad or am fearful or am hateful, whatever. Simply an objectification of thought. Because of that thought, a feeling arose. And feeling is nothing but objectification of thought. Reverse process happens in the night. However sad I have been throughout the day, the I am sad disappears into simply I am. And then finally that I am also disappears into the void or nothingness. This void is devoid of that feeling of sadness or fear or hatred or whatever. It is devoid of feelings completely. It is peace. So again and again, in your own exploration of Every morning waking up and every night going into sleep. Start recognizing these subtle things. See that sadness was just limited to the waking hours. It is not my pure true nature. If it was my true nature and I was sad permanently, constantly, the way my mind story says, then I should have been sad in my sleep. No, I slept peacefully like a log. No idea about sadness. Even if you slept just two hours, see those two hours, you were completely lights out. Peace is the absence of objects, absence of feelings. Feelings arise from peace and set back into peace. The Swarupa of feelings is peace, sweet peace, Madhu Shanti. So on the same lines, if the feeling is very, very clear, Atmananda now takes us into thought in verse 2. Buddha Tilludayam Chetu Bodhatil vilaikeyal, Bodhamano vicharatin, Swarubam nahisam shayam. Since thoughts arise and set in knowledge, their Swarupa is knowledge definitely. Nahisam shayam means without a doubt. So, the Nahi Samshrayam was not translated. So the full translation would be, since thoughts arise and set in knowledge, their Swarupa is knowledge without a doubt. Yeah? Or definitely, whatever you like. So on the same lines as feeling. He has already explained this in chapter 7, that knowledge objectified is thought. Consciousness arises with the sense of I am. It recognizes itself and it says I am. That itself, sense of I am, itself is I thought. So sense of I am is equal to I thought, where it recognizes itself. Objectification of itself is the birth of the thought. It's the first thought. And then from that 
I thought, it attaches to other thoughts and a zillion other stories are created. So the pure consciousness, before the arising of the sense of I am, is itself the source or the bank of knowledge in which the I arose. Yeah, the sense of I is the knowledge of itself. So only in an ocean of knowledge can the wave of knowledge of itself arise. Yeah, that means the Swarupa of that ocean is knowledge. Swarupa is real nature. The real nature of that ocean is knowledge. And in that ocean of knowledge, thoughts arise and set. Yes, we did this in chapter 7 and chapter 9. Knowledge in motion is thought. Thought at rest is knowledge. Every time thoughts arise, they dissolve. Again they arise, they dissolve. Now what happens when I am sad? The natural programming is that the sad thought that says, I am sad, it is going to dissolve. But I have programmed myself to kindle that thought again. Because I had the firm belief, no, I'm this body-mind. And I, this body-mind, don't like this situation. And I am sad. So I had programmed myself to kindle that thought again and again. I am sad. I am sad. I am sad. It dissolves again. Again I kindle the thought. Observe this that you do it to yourself. That is why every scripture, every saint has said that you are the cause of suffering. It is not the external person. The external person said something to me, criticized me. He said it once and he has gone his way. I have repeated that criticism a million times like a broken record to myself. I programmed myself again and again. It disappeared. Again, I repeated it. I programmed myself to repeat it. I am supposed to be feeling bad or sad because the other person criticized me. It dissolves. Again, I kindle it. It dissolves. Again, I kindle it. Recognize that this is what I do. It is only an assumption that the same thought is coming up. If you examine carefully, it is only a similar thought. It is never the same thought. Every now has a new thought. Every now is new, ever new. Sadyo jata. There is nothing like memory. Yeah, because memory would imply that the exact same thought appears. It has to recur. But it's not possible. The same thought never comes again. It is a similar thought. The now is ever new. The thought keeps vanishing again into the background of knowledge. Yeah? The same background of peace is knowledge. It's a data bank. Data can come out of a data bank only. Yes. So knowledge is the ocean and the wave is the thought. Knowledge happens only on the culmination of thought. Knowledge means knowingness. For example, if I speak a completely new sentence, you understand it only when I complete this sentence. Yeah? For example, if I want to say something uh, on the lines of this chapter in Hindi, Dil ki kasak ka swaroop hai sukun. 
You heard the full sentence. The thought arose and repeated the sentence. At the end of the thought, knowingness happened. Knowledge happened. Yeah. When I say something new, knowingness happens at the culmination of thought. This is very, very clear. Yeah. Knowingness happens only at the culmination of thought. After the thought arises and falls, there is knowingness. You are not the thinker of the thought. So you cannot know the thought simultaneously. Yeah, Like I said, there is only one arising at a time. So when there is a thought, there is no knowing at that time. It's a new thought. After the thought sets or resides, knowingness happens, knowledge happens. So the gap in between two thoughts is knowledge. The background is knowingness. Yes. Knowledge equals to the gap between thought. Knowledge equals to the background of thought. When the thought has set, that is knowledge. So, if this is very clear, you will understand that the Swarupa of thought is knowledge. It cannot be anything else. The wave arises, plays and falls into the ocean. The thought arises, plays and falls back into knowledge. The Swarupa is knowledge. What it is made up of is knowledge. It cannot be anything different. So now we understood feelings are nothing but peace, even if it is sadness, even if it is hatred, even if it is fear, it is nothing but sweet peace, madhu shanti. And thoughts, even if they are evil thoughts, they are nothing else but jnana, jnana swarup, knowledge. Yes? We understood sweet peace and we understood gyan, knowledge. So far clear? So if this is clear, the third verse will be very simple to understand. Shandi yum shuddha mayulla Bodhavam parkilunnutan Drishti bedati nal matram Deep peace and pure knowledge are one and the same thing. Madhushanti and Gyan Swarup. Yeah, the sweet peace or deep peace and pure knowledge are one and the same thing. Different names are given to it because it is looked at from different angles. What is the meaning of different angles? I am looking at it from the mind. And that is why I give it different labels. I feel that peace is different than knowledge, is different than consciousness. No, it is all the same. So peace is equal to knowledge, is equal to consciousness, is equal to nothingness, is equal to I, the real I, not the thought I. That which does not say I is the consciousness. Clear? So now what is the meaning of I really? I am thought, I am the gap between thoughts. I am feeling, I am the gap between feelings. I am perception, I am the gap between perceptions. I am sensation, I am the gap between sensations. I am happiness, I am sadness, I am passion, I am fear, hatred, 
I am peace, I am knowledge. I am everything. Ekatvam, there is only one. There are no two. There is no place, no room for two. Prem gali ati sankari, tame dauna samai. This path is so narrow, there is no room for two. Yeah. It is the path of love. So that same deep peace is equal to pure knowledge, is equal to love. Yeah. Baki love, that romantic love that you have between spouses and partners, and that is just a reflection of this true love. There is no two. There is no two. Deep peace and pure knowledge are one and the same thing. Different names are given to it because it is looked at from different angles. So that completes the verses. I'll give you a little homework before we take questions. All of you are doing the spiritual journal, so you know your obstacles. And if you, if you have really done good manana and started doing nididhyasa in life, you must have recognized your own obstacles on your path. And most of your obstacles are loaded with some strong emotion. Yes? So this emotion plus thought together is weaving mind stories and that's where I get consumed and I lose my witnessing position. So if you recognize this, um, a tip has been given by Atmananda. He says that deep mental activity generates a lot of heat. Notice when you have that particular drama obstacle come up. Your body heats up, your mind is hot. Yeah. And steering away from that unnecessary, unrequired mental activity is the only way to move towards cooling off. Yeah, we are not talking at the body-mind level. Here the witness has become one with the body-mind. So the only way for the witness to move away from the body-mind is to steer away from unnecessary, unrequired mental activity. Cool off. The witness will automatically take a step back. In deep sleep, there is a sense of happiness, a sense of peace. Yes, that same sense of peace is there with open eyes when you withdraw from mental activity, withdraw from the arisings. Now, if you understand there is only one, there is either I or the arising. There are no two also. So just withdraw from the arising and just be in that space of nothingness. Yeah? Steer away from that mental activity. You will be able to equate that peace, that coolness with the peace of deep sleep. Yeah? So in open night day, go back to the gap. Steer away from the arisings. Hold on to the gap then. Keep holding on to the peace that is there in the gap between mental activity. So this is what we do when we are awake. And now, when you lie down to get into bed, you'll notice that there is a sense of relief in the night when you're lying down and you feel, oh, I'm going to rest now. There's a moment of relief before thoughts start rushing in. All negative thoughts and all thoughts that can keep your mind busy. 
So to stay away from negation, hold on to that happiness aspect, that relief aspect when you lie down. Just when you lie down, there is a, okay, done. Lying down, resting. Yeah, that, hold on to that. That happiness is your key. It is going to take you to the nothingness. We get to our real nature by relaxing our mind from all kinds of activities. So now thoughts start coming up. Yeah? But you relax from them. Don't lose sight of that happiness. Don't lose sight of that peace. Know that this is the same peace that I experience in deep sleep. So this positive aspect, it saves us from that probable negation. I am not awake, I am not at peace, I am not happy, I, I, blah, 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 blah. That is all negation, negativity. You hold on to that positive aspect, that soft peace. And then you move into sleep. So, in other words, he gave you a clue. He said, we should not allow the mind to be active and at the same time, we should see that it does not become inactive. Why? If it becomes inactive completely, then the knowingness is not there. So he said, be awake knowingly, dream knowingly, sleep knowingly. Because deep sleep can be utilized directly for establishing in the real center. So hold on to that relief and then just keep holding on to that. Hold on to the gap in between thoughts, gap in between two arisings. That sense of relief when you are lying down to sleep. Yes? That will enable you to just be in no thingness 24-7. Do you see where we are moving to now? It's getting tougher and tougher. The shlokas go on reducing and the knowledge becomes deeper and deeper. So what so, he is saying is you have given too much fuel to the thought. You are interested in the thought. A thought will not come up if you are not interested in it. Mm -hmm. Do you think about kangaroos in Australia? No. What? No, you don't. Why will you think about kangaroos in Australia? What have I got to do with it? Because that is not something you want to give energy to. What is coming to you? That which you have an interest in. You are giving energy to. So Atmananda has given a clue here. Because I'm giving energy, that thought or that feeling has become this big drama in my life. I look at that which is in the gap. In the gap between the thought is knowledge and the gap between the feeling is peace. Hold on to that peace. That peace is nothing but happiness, love, knowledge, whatever you want to call it. But then there are some thoughts that have been programmed in the personality for years and years. That's okay. They will go. Okay. okay. <laughs> they will go. Automatically that will go. But you say that okay, they are programmed, so they are supposed to be there and you keep giving attention, you are programming them more for the future. Okay. Yeah? So don't fuel it. That's not an excuse to allow thoughts that they are programmed. That is just so that you don't get exasperated with yourself that, oh, I'm not changing at all. It takes time. Deha buddhi lags behind the attitude change. Mm -hmm. I, don't create, I don't create the guest, but the guest does come to my house. It's up to me whether I say Tata bye bye at the door or I invite the guest in. But I have not created the man. No. 
exactly the same way. Yeah, I've not created the thought, but the thought comes knocking, the feeling comes knocking. It's up to me whether I open the door and serve them tea or do not open the door. No, you forgot. <laughs> Knowing is your only possibility. Yes, that's true. So <laughs> thoughts are just coming and uh, you just know they are coming. Mm. And thoughts are not okay. related to the action. Correct. So many times you tell your husband, do this, do this, do this, do this. Yet he doesn't land up doing it. Right or wrong? Right. Thought is not equal to action. It is not necessarily going to turn into action. They are independently arising and falling of their own accord. I can only know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like find an obstacle and then go deep in it and forget it. Yes, just know. Yeah, yeah you just know. It's happening. The thought arises, it falls. It is not necessarily that the thought has translated into action. Yeah? On some day, suppose on a weekend, you get some time, just go cycling or walking, whatever, alone. And see, you decide, okay, I am going to, before I leave the house, you decide, I am going to take this path and then here and here and then I am going to come back home. You decide. And you be very vigilant when you start your walk or your bike ride. You will see, you will not be able to follow the exact path. Not possible. Even if you think like, okay, now there is a bifurcation coming up. I like this side also. It's very pretty to walk this side. Oh, but I love the roses on this side. You, you'll see thoughts coming up and you'll see a thought that said, no, today I want to see the roses. It's so bright and sunny. They look beautiful. And you'll see the body automatically taking a turn there. And you wonder, what's going on? Yes, thoughts are not what really turn into action. Only our assumption. So just let the body do what it has to do. Let the mind do what it has to do. You just hold on to the peace, the happiness. Yes, I don't have to fight you. <laughs>